right. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Or if you're watching this after the fact and it's streaming, I don't know what time it is. So good whatever time it is where you are. Um, before we get started, I wanted to thank a few people today. Uh, first of all, Device42, I mentioned last week, uh, it's, a, it's a company that makes uh, products to help you to see all of your IT infrastructure. And they contacted me a couple weeks ago and said, uh, we want to sponsor another, week, another month of giving away Ansible for DevOps and Ansible for Kubernetes. Uh, so thank you to them, and I, I wanted to give them a plug, so I asked them for, for some way to describe them. And uh, they're basically uh, an, uh, a tool that goes along well with Ansible. And so Ansible is a great tool for IT automation, but to make that automation work, you need to make sure you have an accurate real-time picture of all of your IT infrastructure, and that's where Device42 comes in. Uh, Device42 provides comprehensive discovery of your entire IT estate from mainframes to Kubernetes. And just like Ansible, it's agentless. Uh, and you can try it for free. You can download a, a trial today at device42.com and see how it can take your Ansible automation to the next level. I also wanted to thank uh, a lot of people for sponsoring me on GitHub and Patreon. Uh, I Every video I've kind of just said, you know, if, if you are interested in these things, want to see more and want to support my work on Ansible roles and collections and content and my books and things. When I sell a book, I sell it one time and I give away updates free forever. So, you know, if you're interested in, in trying to help me be able to keep updating those books without necessarily getting revenue over time from, from increased book sales, because once you buy it, you don't have to rebuy it. Um, I really encourage you to support me on Patreon or GitHub sponsors or send me a Venmo or whatever kind of thing you want to do. Um, but thank you especially on Patreon to Carl Silippo. And again, I'm very sorry about butchering names. I'm not great at uh, pronunciation. Also, Mark Winkler. And on GitHub, uh, I'll just say the usernames because it's easier than the real names. Uh, SS Barnia, D. Kruer, uh, Kjo SC, uh, Dan Kwa, Laurent David, RRW, Gitressa, Dopsy, T. Lazat. Uh, sometimes the username has the, the actual name in it, so it's a little harder. A. Colby and D4, and there's also a few other people who are private sponsors. Thank you so much. Um, you're giving me the ability to spend a little more time working on these things, uh, this video series, uh, updating the books, updating the, the projects that are used in the books, making them continuously relevant to, uh, to new readers and to old readers. Um, also, thank you to everybody who subscribed. I, I mentioned on Twitter uh, last week that this year I started out the year thinking, uh, you know, one, one small goal would be to increase my YouTube subscriber uh, base to maybe 5,000 subscribers. And a couple weeks ago I started doing this Ansible 101 series and now I'm at 7,500 subscribers. So I think I set my sights a little low apparently. And uh, now I'm trying to think of what I can do if I hit uh, 10,000 subscribers, what kind of fun things I can do on the channel to, to give people fun content. Um, and if I hit 10,000 before all this pandemic stuff is over, uh, I'll definitely be trying to think of ways to, to make some more entertaining, fun content for the channel. Um, some people on chat are asking if you're late. No, you're not late. Uh, just going through some thanks uh, and being grateful for, for everything that's going on. Um, I also wanted to call out to people, please consider giving uh, donations to your food, food pantries, local food pantries. If you're, the, if you're in the U.S., there's a website, feed, feedingamerica.com. You can search for local food pantries to donate to. Uh, since they can't get in-person food donations as much anymore, some of them are really struggling to have food on the shelves to give people, and there's more people trying to get food because of layoffs and furloughs and, and people who are not able to get the same work that they used to. So consider giving to a local food bank, um, especially a, a money donation right now so they can get the food that they need to, get, to help people. Um, there were a few questions from last week's episode too. Uh, one of them was um, for item potence. I mentioned last week, item potence is the principle of being able to do something once or many times and it doesn't make a change after that first time. And it's part of what makes Ansible really powerful is you can uh, you can set a state that you desire, and then an Ansible makes that state happen on your servers. What if you need to do something like update apt's cache using the in the apt module? There's a there's the ability to run basically apt update, uh, and that's not item potent because it always results in a change. Well, Ansible is can it can be configured to be more intelligent about that. Um, 
you can set a cache lifetime like a day or an hour or something like that where it won't update the cache if it's already updated within the past hour or day or whatever. So that's usually what I do for item potents there. Another way you can say uh, it can maintain item potence with something you know is not going to make a substantial change is you can set changed underscore when equals false, and that will tell Ansible this doesn't actually change anything. It, you know, don't ever report that this changes something. If you're running the date command, you can do that because running date is not going to change anything on your system. It's just getting information. Um, a lot of people all over the place, Twitter and on YouTube, on, on the YouTube comments, in the live chat, everybody's asking about using Molecule for testing Ansible roles or testing Ansible playbooks or testing things with Kubernetes. Uh, don't worry, we will get to that. Uh, it's not actually in the book yet. I'm working on the chapter, revamping the testing chapter. So we'll get to that later in the series. Uh, don't worry about that right now, but I do have a blog post up on jeffgearling.com and uh, you can go there and find out how to use how to use molecule for testing your roles um, or just look at any of the roles that i have on galaxy all of them have a molecule directory with all the test setups in them uh, can you post your ansible recipes for elasticsearch i mentioned a couple episodes ago um, all of the things that i'm doing in this book not only are they in the book uh, but most of these examples also are in the books repository on github which i'm in right now uh, it's uh, gearling guy slash ansible for devops and this is linked to from the book's website, so ansibleforDevops.com. Scroll down to the bottom, and there's a link to the book's repository. <clears throat> it has all the examples, almost all the examples from the book, and they're listed by chapter here. I'm actually moving a few more examples into here as well uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that is missing is a working inventory system. Somebody asked this. It was funny in the last episode. Uh, is there a way to have a UI or some central display of all that server information for my infrastructure? And uh, that dovetailed nicely with the sponsor of this, this month's videos and the free books this month, which is Device42, because they have a system that does that. Um, Ansible, is not, Ansible is not a system that's built to like maintain an inventory of all your IT infrastructure. Usually you'd have a tool like that already, and Ansible can pull the inventory information out and work on those servers and work on those network devices and Windows boxes, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so those are a few questions from the last episode. I always run through the, the live chat and the uh, comments on the, the episodes before the next one. So I'll, I'll try to keep up with this. And you know, if you ask something and, and I don't see it uh, live during this episode, that's fine. Usually I can find it later. Uh, or if I don't, Put, post it as a comment on the video because I see those as well. And I'll get to it uh, in the next episode like we did here. Uh, so let's get into things again. Last week, uh, the last thing that we did was talked about uh, ad hoc uh, commands and running them against multiple servers. So <clears throat> I'm going to switch over to uh, our Vagrant file that we created last week. We created uh, two app servers and a database server in Vagrant and Vagrant creates a VirtualBox machine. Uh, you can also use Vagrant with other systems as well, but I'm using VirtualBox locally. Uh, and we described those servers in Ansible's inventory. So we have the app servers in an app group, and this inventory file is using Ansible's INI style uh, inventory syntax. Uh, so we have an app group with these two servers, and then we have a DB group with this server, and then we created a group of groups called multi that has all the servers and we set some variables for it so that Ansible knows how to connect to those servers. And last week we did a lot of commands like getting the date on the servers and things like that. But I'm going to pick up back in Ansible for DevOps, which again is free right now. Um, you can get it on LeanPub for free if you desire uh, or also Ansible for Kubernetes. Uh, we're gonna go back into chapter three and we're on right in version 1.22, page 36. Uh, talking about running operations in the background. So a lot of times you can run a run something and it's it's relatively quick. So um, I think we had the example ansible i oops, I'm in the wrong directory right now. Ansible i inventory, um, and we wanted to run it on all the servers. So we had the multi group, and we just ran uh, date, and that is going to run the date command on all the servers and give back the output. <coughs> if it ever finishes. We had this problem last week where uh, things are a little slower when I'm live streaming. I think somebody, oops, I, I hid Safari so I can't see my own 
<coughs> live chat window, but uh, somebody somebody mentioned uh, last week uh, what what streaming software are you using and that kind of stuff, talking about how I should consider using a Linux machine instead of a Mac or Windows or all these different things. And it just comes down to uh, I have like a five-year-old Mac right now, and, and I, I'm considering upgrading at some point this year. Uh, and maybe this will force me to do it sooner just because things are a little faster uh, with a newer computer with more CPU. But anyway, so we ran a command, and uh, just going back over how this works, Ansible is a way to run ad hoc tasks, or if you're in Britain, ad hoc. Um, so Ansible is that command. Most of the time in Ansible, you're, you'll be using the Ansible playbook command, or if you use tools like Tower, you don't even have to know the commands that are being run in the background, but you'll be running a playbook and not commands like this. Uh, but we always pass an inventory. There's another way you can tell Ansible about your inventory file using an Ansible configuration file. We'll get into that later. Uh, but Ansible has to know about where your servers are, so we specify an inventory file. Um, and we'll also get into later different ways that you can use inventories uh, for more flexibility. You can actually pass folders and scripts and other things that give inventory. Then we tell Ansible about what servers we want to run this command on. So uh, using multi matched to this, which tells Ansible to run it on app and DB, which tells it to run it on all these three. And we also mentioned last week how uh, when you tell Ansible to run commands by default, it uses five forks. So every time you run the command, it can it can run them in a different order on these servers. So you can see it did the dot five, dot six, and dot four. So it did it in a different order. Um, and if you wanted to change that to make it so that it runs on the first server defined first, second server second, you can define uh, dash f one, uh, and then it should run on dot four, then dot five, then dot six. But it's slower because it has to it does it in sequence instead of in parallel. Uh, and then finally, if you pass dash A, it's going to pass a, a command straight to Ansible's command module. Uh, that's the default if you don't specify a module, but this is the equivalent of saying dash M, oops, command, and then dash A date. It's, it's going to do the same thing. Uh, but sometimes commands take a long time. So one thing that could take a long time is yum upgrades or apt upgrades if you're on Debian or Ubuntu. Um, running a script that, that takes an hour or two to complete. Maybe it's a, a job to maintain your server or to copy some giant file or something like that. Any of those kind of commands can take a while. So Ansible also lets you background tasks. So instead of running it right away and then waiting for it to finish and then giving you the output, you can start the task in the background and then you can get the job uh, status later. Uh, so when you're doing that, there's two main options for it. Uh, one is the dash uppercase B command with a number of seconds, and that's how long in seconds you want to allow the job to run. So it can run, um, you know, you can you can give it an hour, and then if it takes more than an hour, Ansible will kill it, uh, something like that, just to make sure that it doesn't go on forever. Um, and then also there's a dash P. Uh, dash P gives you a polling time in seconds, and that's how often Ansible will check in to see if the job is complete or not. Uh, and you can run it, you can run a command and have it backgrounded on the command line with polling. Uh, but usually what I would do is set the dash P option to zero. And uh, the interesting thing is there's actually a bug in Ansible 2.0, which is now a little bit old uh, and later, that the polling doesn't actually work correctly on the command line. Uh, it's a little bit complicated why that is. Um, but uh, but in the book, it links to the issue where you can track progress on that. It's not that useful anyways. If you're going to run a command that's going to take an hour, you're not going to leave it sitting on your, your desktop too often. And if you were going to do that, you don't even have to use the backgrounding and run asynchronous uh, commands anyways. Uh, but we're going to run a yum update on these servers since that could take a long time, especially with the fact that my computer's dying from, from the streaming. Um, but we're going to run a yum update command in the background, and then we can check on the progress. Uh, so I'm going to do the same thing, ansible-i inventory uh, dash, or multi for all the servers. And then I'm going to use dash b to become this root user. So dash b is the equivalent of become user. And that uses, by default, sudo to become the root user on the server, because we need to be root to be able to do this yum, uh, yum update command. And then I'm going to pass dash b3600. That's, uh, what is 3600 divided by 60? So that's 60 minutes, one hour. Uh, usually I have these numbers memorized, but uh, 
I know 86, 400 is a day and you know, 500 is five minutes and those kind of things, but this is a second. So uh, 3,600 is allow for an hour for this uh, task to complete. I'm going to do dash P zero. Uh, that means that it's just going to exit out. It's the equivalent of, of passing the output to like no hub and, and the, the command just goes back to your terminal, but it runs in the background, but Ansible will manage this uh, on the server side. Uh, and then I'm going to say dash a yum dash y update. And again, if I don't give it a module, so no, there's no dash m, it's going to default to the command module. Uh, so it'll pass this command to the command module. And this should uh, kick the process off on each of the servers. And when it gives me output, it will also give me a results file for each server. And that results file gives us a job ID, and the job ID can be used to check on the progress of that job. Uh, so uh, the dot six is our database server. So this is the job ID on the database server, and it gives us a different job ID for each server. Um, actually, the Ansible job ID has the job ID. Uh, so I'm going to grab this job ID, and I can check the progress of that command on that server using the job ID with uh, the async status module. So I'm going to say Ansible inventory uh, multi dash b. I don't. I don't, actually, I don't think I need the, the root user, but um, I have it in the book, so I'm going to keep it here. So I'm going to use the async status module and give it the argument job ID equals that. And um, actually, since, the, since it's unique per server, this job ID won't exist on the two app servers. So I'm just going to run this on the DB server instead. So I'm going to use the group DB. And run that command and it should give me back the job status as well as it will give me the output from that job. So this, again, this, this is something that you probably won't use too much, but every once in a while it can come in handy to be able to just kick off a job on your servers with Ansible using your same inventory. And then later on you can check the status or even if you don't check the status, not the end of the world. Um, but here's the, the job status. It says that it finished, finished is one. This is when it finished. Uh, and this is how long it took to run the command, and then it gives you the output. Uh, it gives you two options. Most things in Ansible give you output uh, all in one blob here, or it also breaks up the lines, uh, depending on how you want to consume that if you write some, some automation to deal with the output. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that you can do to, um, to run tasks in the background. And uh, another note that I have in the book is that if you're not tracking the progress of something remotely, it's still a good idea to make sure that whatever it's doing is being logged somewhere. Because if this fails, Ansible is not going to put that failure on your screen automatically. You're going to have to check on it manually. Uh, so it's not always a great, um, not always a great idea, but it can come in handy sometimes. Um, another thing that you can do with ad hoc commands is uh, check on logs. This is, again, something where it's typically better to have a central logging system for this kind of thing. Uh, but if you did need to glance at the end of some log files on a bunch of servers really fast, it's a way to do it. So I can say Ansible multi-b-a. And da again, dash b is there because I need to become root to see some of the log, log uh, files that are in the log directory. Uh, tail var log messages. Uh, whoops, I didn't give it an inventory file. Inventory. And that's just going to dump out uh, the messages from each of these different, each of these three servers uh, to the screen. Uh, so sometimes that can be useful for debugging. There's a bunch of other things you can do. Another quick note is if you're going to do something like, let's say I wanted to see how many lines were in each of these, uh, each of these messages, uh, you can also, um, Let's see. So, so one of the things I want to see is how many times was Ansible command run in the log. So I want to pass through grep Ansible command because I can see it was in here and it was in here. Um, and then I want to see how many times it occurred. So wc-l. If I do this, it's going to fail because uh, Ansible's command module doesn't happen ha handle pipes and redirection and things like that. So what you want to do if you ever need to do that is use the shell module, which is dash m shell. It's generally a best practice not to use shell unless you absolutely need to use shell. Uh, so, but shell will work with pipes and redirection, so I can get back uh, the output of that that full command. Um, there's plenty of other things you can do. I'm not going to go through all of them here, uh, but 
I will say that you can manage uh, cron jobs using the cron module. Uh, and you give it a name equals something and an hour equals whatever it is, you know, hour, minute, uh, day, all those kind of things, and then give it a job, um, path to script.sh, something like that. Uh, so you can manage cron jobs through it. Um, you can also delete a cron job using uh, state equals absent. Um, you can also use other modules, like uh, one thing that you could do if, if you needed to uh, run a command to update a server's Git repository, is you could use the Git module, uh, dash m git, and uh, you can give it a repo. Uh, so GitHub URL goes here, and give it a destination, dest equals opt app, and uh, update. Oops, update equals yes, version equals 1.2.4. So some people sometimes use this just to to uh, update a, a repository that's on their server for an application that's deployed. Uh, again, this is something where you should probably have a playbook and more automation for this. If you're using Ansible Tower, you'd have a, a project um, and a job template set up for this so that uh, when you update your app, maybe when you create the tag on GitHub, it can, it can use a webhook in Tower to tell Tower to do the deployment and anything else that needs to happen after that deployment is complete. Uh, but I'm just showing here that it is possible you could do all of your infrastructure automation just using the command line with Ansible. I don't recommend it though because uh, that's not getting closer to infrastructure as code and you can't really test it as well. And in the book, in the end of chapter three, I talk a little bit about Ansible's SSH connection history, how it started with Paramico and uses OpenSSH now. Uh, and one important thing to note is that I believe that the default for Ansible is still uh, to not have pipelining turned on, and that can actually slow down your playbooks quite a bit. Uh, so uh, one thing that I typically recommend doing is uh, if you have an Ansible configuration file, uh, so I'm going to save this file called Ansible, come on, ansible.cfg. Uh, in your Ansible configuration file, you can say under SSH connection, uh, pipelining how can I spell it? Mining equals true. Uh, that's going to use SSH pipelining to make sure that when it creates an SSH connection to your server, it can reuse that connection over and over for commands instead of having to reestablish a connection. I believe that's still the default in Ansible 2.9, but that might have changed recently. I need to check on that. Uh, but if, if it did change, then the default's great. But if it didn't, I, uh, this is going to help you have faster playbooks, which we'll get to in chapter four, which we're getting to now. Uh, so uh, any if there's any questions about uh, ad hoc commands or anything that I've just done in the few past couple minutes, please uh, post them in the live chat. I'll check on that really quick while I take a quick drink. Yeah, and... Uh, Again, Omega BK asked, uh, do you have a session for using Molecule and step-by-step? -step? And yes, uh, earlier in this episode, I, I talked a little bit about that, how we'll, we'll get to that um, at some point in the next few episodes. Um, uh, something about Vagrant, and uh, oh, I'm glad I helped you in your internship with uh, Vagrant. And ha, Aaron, uh, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, if you If you can pay for the book, I would love if you paid for the book, but... Uh, the main thing, I've mentioned this a couple times before, uh, I, I really hope that, um, you know, especially if you're, you're in a situation where you're furloughed or your pay has been reduced or anything like that, I don't want to worry so much about the money. I just want you to learn the skills and maybe later on down the line, if you do end up being helped by the book and find it valuable and have the means, then you could support me some other way. But uh, the main thing is to get the book now and worry about the payment later, unless you can pay now. Um, nothing else right now, just some thank yous. All right, so we're going to get into chapter four, which is Ansible playbooks. Um, and uh, Ansible playbooks, so on the command line, it's all, it's all, it's not super discoverable. It's not super readable. Uh, you can't version control this stuff. Uh, you, you could shell script it, but that, that defeats the purpose of using Ansible. Uh, playbooks are written in YAML, and 
if you if you hang out on Hacker News, uh, there's there's always this fun uh, battle. There's there's people who hate YAML and then people who are pragmatic about YAML. And I'm somebody who's pragmatic about YAML, and it's the fact that like it's not great for complex configuration, but nothing else is either, and it's the best thing that we have, and it's way better than something like JSON, and it's better, in my opinion, than using a programming language or something derived from a programming language, because then you limit the audience that can work with it and understand it greatly. So Ansible has a good abstraction layer uh, that pulls out a lot of things that are hard to do in shell scripts and makes them easy to do using YAML, using Ansible's modules. Uh, and that's what we're going to get into it. I think one of the things that I like the most about the way that Ansible playbooks work is I work a lot of times with people who are PHP developers, Ruby developers, Python developers, uh, Go developers, Java developers. All of them can understand Ansible, at, at least at the basic levels, very easily. They can pick it up in an hour or less. When I tried using other tools like Puppet or Chef or... Um, Salt stack is a little bit different. It, it, it's a little easier in some ways, but it also has a little bit more difficult model of usage, I think. Uh, but when I tried using the other ones, it, it a lot of times wasn't that easy to pick up unless you were already a person who understood the base language it was written in. With Ansible, that's not the case. It's, it just so happens to be written in Python, which is an approachable, easy-ish language to learn. But you don't have to know anything about Python to start using Ansible. And that's why I liked it a lot. Um, also, really quick here, uh, Aaron mentioned something about using 2.10 much. Ansible 2.10 is not yet released. It won't be probably till later this year. But there will be some changes in Ansible 2.10. <clears throat> and uh, the book will be updated for those changes, and so will uh, some examples. Almost everything you see in these videos, though, will still work with 2.10. There might be some minor differences, and unfortunately, that's just the nature of the world uh, when you're doing anything tech-related. Uh, I'm considering doing some Kubernetes uh, live streams as well, and those will be out of date by the time probably the live stream is over. Like Things will work when I start the live stream. When it's over, there will be a new Kubernetes version releases that deprecates everything I just used. Uh, that's kind of the nature of the beast with uh, tech stuff, but hopefully these videos will be relevant through 2.11, 2.12, and beyond. Um, but there will be some things that change. Anyway, so uh, one thing that would happen a lot of times, so I'm going to go over to, I'm going to say vagrant uh, destroy dash F. That's going to kill these three VMs that we've been using and practicing with on, on these examples. And I'm going to go over to another directory uh, called playbooks. Uh, I'm going to close this out. And I'm going to open this directory in here. And I have a server set up in my inventory. It's an Amazon EC2 server. This is its IP address, and this is the uh, key pair file that I downloaded from Amazon for the server. And uh, so I can connect to the server, and we're going to create a playbook soon, but first I'm going to create a quick shell script. Uh, so I'm going to say touch, uh, we'll call it uh, Apache, well, we'll call it shell script.sh, um, and I'm going to make it executable. Uh, plus x shell script. And uh, in this shell script, I'll show how up until the time I started using Ansible, this is how I usually configured a, a quick web server using Apache. Uh, and this is uh, this example uses, um, uh, why this is also a small font. Sorry about that if you can't read this. Um, this example is running on CentOS, but it would be similar, but a little bit different if you're running on Debian or Ubuntu. And in the book, there's examples for both. Um, but the first thing that I would do is install Apache. If you're on Debian or Ubuntu, the first thing you would do is probably update apt caches. Um, but I'm going to say yum install uh, dash dash quiet. And uh, the reason I'm adding these commands is I'm making a shell script to do it. If I was doing it interactively, I could just do it like yum install httpd, and then I could answer the prompts and things. But in a shell script, you have to know more things about like how to make sure that the shell script doesn't stop or how to make sure the shell script isn't giving you output that makes you confused. Uh, so I'm going to do that with HTTPD, HTTPD, that is so hard to say, HTTPD devel. Uh, so that's going to install Apache. I'm going to copy, copy configuration files in place. Uh, so I'm going to say cp dot config to let's see, HTTPD 
uh, config HTTPD. I'm just going to stop saying that word because I cannot pronounce that. Um, vhost uh, HTTPD vhost.config. So we would install Apache, copy over some of our customized configuration files, and then uh, configuration files, and then we'd start Apache and configure it to run at boot. So we'd say service ht whoops service httpd start and check config httpd on. Uh, so this shell script is not. I mean, it's gonna it's gonna do what it says. It's gonna install Apache, um, but you're not gonna know whether it was already installed or not. It's gonna copy this these files blindly on top of whatever's there, but it's not gonna give you the opportunity to say um, you know whether it was copied or not, or give you a thing like back up the file. If I wanted to back up the file, I'd have to check if the file's there, back it up if it's there, then copy the file, all that kind of stuff. Um, then it's going to just blindly try starting the service. Even if it's running, it'll, it'll try starting it again, which typically won't cause a problem for a, a properly configured service. And then it's going to make sure that it's set up on system boot. Um, so this is a pretty common pattern for any application you're going to install. You're going to do something like you're going to build it from source, download it from somewhere, or install it using your system package manager. Then you're going to copy some configuration files in place and then make sure that the thing is running and set up uh, to run on boot, or if it's a container, uh, set the entry point or something like that. Uh, so we're going to do the equivalent type of thing, but using an Ansible playbook. Um, and uh, I'm not going to run this shell script on the server because it's not item potent and it will and it'll cause uh, some funny things to happen with our Ansible playbook. Uh, but I'm going to create a separate file um, uh, called playbook.yml. And you can call your playbook whatever you want. Uh, one common pattern is to call it main.yaml. Whatever the main thing is that's going to automate your server, you'd call that main.yaml. And then any other playbooks you have could be, like I, I often have one main.yaml that sets everything up and deploys my application. And I have a separate playbook called deploy.yaml that does deployments only. And the, the main.yaml can even call that other playbook at the end if it needs to. Uh, but I'm going to call this playbook.yaml. And this is not strictly required, but I always do it for YAML files. I start the document with this three dashes, and that is a YAML document separator. And it's a good practice to get into just because later on when you get more advanced usage, you might have multiple YAML documents in one file, especially if you're doing things like Kubernetes work. Uh, so I always start with a, the dashes just to say, I'm starting a YAML file here. Because technically speaking, and this is something that may or may not work depending on what language you're using in YAML parser, uh, this text here is plain text and not YAML. But below here, this is now YAML, and you can separate multiple YAML documents by using more of these. So this would be YAML1 and YAML2. However, uh, with Ansible's YAML parser, this would actually be evaluated as YAML, but we'll not get into that. Uh, this is one of the one of the many reasons some people hate YAML is because there are some ambiguities and some differences between different languages and platforms. Um, and uh, Stefan mentions in the chat that the the uh, separator is actually required by YAML int, and yeah, that's another good reason too. But uh, some people ignore linting and and don't follow best practices. But whatever. Um, so like that, like the playbook that we did, and I, I believe it was episode one, uh, you start off by saying, uh, well, some, sometimes you start off by saying name of the play is install Apache. Um, so that's the play name. And then hosts is all. I want it to run on any host that's in the in inventory. I could also say hosts EC2. Uh, that's the group that this one server is under. Or I could even say hosts and then just list this, this IP address or host name. Uh, but I'm just going to say host all, and then um, I'm going to give it some tasks. And the first task will be installing yum. So in, in this one, we did it uh, using yum install dash dash quiet dash uh, y. In Ansible, we'll say name um, install Apache. So already we have the ability to give a, this is kind of like a comment and a name for the task that will appear in our output. So in the shell script, when it runs this, it's not going to give us any indication besides yum's output that it's installing Apache. But in Ansible, it's going to print this above whatever it does to install Apache. So that's 
that's a nice convenience feature right there. Um, and then I'm going to say uh, command yum install dash dash quiet dash y HTTP 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 I cannot spell and I can't type it either. Vel. Um, and then I'm going to say name copy configuration files. And I can already see a few people probably steaming it. What? Wait, he's just putting the command straight into his playbook. This is terrible. You're not using Ansible to its full potential. And that's true, but I'll get to that. Uh, configuration files and then command. And since this command is a little bit longer and it might run off the screen over here, I'm going to use a YAML convention. Uh, this is called the folded scaler. You don't have to know what that means, but this just basically means take everything from this line down that's indented at the same level and merge it using a space between each line. So in this case, I'm just going to have one line, which is the same as this, uh, copy this file. Um, but uh, And the only reason I did that was because if I don't do it, well, actually, it, it fits on the screen here, but um, sometimes it goes off the screen depending on what zoom level I'm at in Sublime. Uh, and then I'm going to have another one. Uh, oh, uh, so in the book example, I actually have two separate commands like this. Whoops. And I do the next one here. Again, this is not the best way to do it with Ansible, but I'm just illustrating a point, which I'll get to very soon. Name, start, Apache, and configure it to run at boot. Uh, and then command service HTTP start and command check config HTTP on. Uh, so this playbook is the equivalent of this shell script. Already though, we're getting a, a few things that we don't get in the shell script. One is that Ansible will start checking, did this command change anything? Unfortunately, because command can't be super intelligent about these tasks, it's always going to report a change because it, it can't know all the details about when yum uh, performs changes and not, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it does give us labels for every section of the playbook that we're running, uh, and it can let us uh, put all this uh, put all these commands into a more formatted and, and structured list and you can you can space things out a little nicer so that you can see more of the sections of what's happening here um, and th the reason why I did it this way is just to show this is how I started using ansible in the first place I, I already had a lot of shell scripts like this set up for my servers and um, and instead of spending all the time to try to make like learn everything about Ansible and do everything the Ansible way right away, the cool thing about Ansible was I could just literally pop in a bunch of commands. Um, and, and you could even do things like, um, instead of having all of these commands separate tasks like this, which is a better way to get started doing it because you're separating everything out into an individual task and you can, uh, you can put a name and a label on each task. Uh, but you could even do something like this where... Uh, I'm going to say shell, and then I can copy multiple lines in here. And you could literally dump a shell script into an Ansible playbook like this, and it will run all these commands. Uh, this is, I forget exactly what that's called. Uh, let's see. Um, YAML pipe. So the little, this little guy is a folded scaler, and the pipe is a multi-line scaler. Uh, so what this does is instead of merging these lines with a space in between them when it runs them, it merges them with a new line between them. So it, it literally runs it like a shell script. Um, and uh, tip number 2000 or so is I always Google everything anyways. Some people think I know all these things out of my head, but I, I just know how to Google. That's most of computer science, I guess. Most of real world computer science. Uh, some people have to, I guess, make algorithms and things, but that's not what I do. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go back to how this was here. Uh, so that, that's a cool thing about Ansible is you can just take anything that's in a shell script and dump it into Ansible right away, and it, it starts working. And you're already a little bit better off, but we want to get a lot better off. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, and, and also in the book, I, I start to mention, too, that there's a few different ways that you can do these uh, start writing Ansible tasks. So we'll, we'll start with this top one here. Uh, and if you if, actually, if you run this task, Ansible will print out a warning that says, like, you shouldn't use the yum, you shouldn't use yum in a command. 
And you can actually squelch that warning if you want to uh, squelch or disable it, turn off that warning. Um, if you are using yum for something that the Ansible's particular yum module doesn't work that well for, which is very limited in, in uh, it, the yum module does almost anything. So you shouldn't ever really have to do it, but every once in a while you might have to. Uh, but we're, we'll take this first, <laughs> sorry, this first task and I'm going to grab it and put it in a new line. And we're gonna install Apache uh, using Ansible's yum module. So instead of using command, I'm gonna say yum. And uh, there's two ways that you can format Ansible tasks. One way is more of the structured YAML way where it's, it's an object that uh, is passed to the yum, the yum command. The other way is, I, I, I guess it's called like Ansible shorthand syntax. And we've been using that on the command line a lot over here uh, where you give a key and then equal sign and then a value. And so you could say uh, yum uh, with, let's see, yum with uh, name equals HTTP. Um, actually, it's interesting. I, I don't know if it's a list like this that you'd use. Um, uh, and this is one reason why this, this particular syntax is not usually preferred. Uh, but you could say name equals HTTP, state equals uh, present, and that will make sure that it's installed. Uh, but the syntax that's preferred for most cases when you're writing playbooks is to use the structured uh, YAML. So I can say name, and then you can pass it one or more items in a list, or if you're just installing one thing, you can give it the name, like HTTP, like that. But since we're installing two things, I'm gonna give it a list, HTTP, devel. And then uh, it's you don't have to do this because it's the default, but I always do it just to be specific and because later on, when I'm revising the playbook to make it so I can also uninstall things, it's easier if you already have this all set up and you can use a variable to state whether it's present or absent. You give it a state and we're gonna say we want this to be present. Um, and you might wonder again, like last week, where am I getting all these things? Uh, for me, I've memorized a lot of them, uh, but if you don't know uh, what options are available for a module, you can say Ansible doc uh, yum, I believe it is. And that's going to give me the documentation for the yum module and give me all the options. Uh, so that's there, but I, I often prefer to look at the information online. Uh, so if you say Ansible yum module, it usually is the first first thing in the list. And you can find all of the gory details about uh, options you can pass to yum, along with examples. The examples are usually the best part of this because uh, we're writing a task that's almost identical to this first task here. Uh, and you can, as it says here, you can use state latest to get the latest version and, and update it if it's already installed. It'll update it to the latest version that's available in your package manager. Uh, but we're just making sure it's installed right now. We don't want to update it if it's already installed. Uh, so that's the yum module. And what this gives us versus the first command is Ansible has a yum module that will do everything that we need to check if it's installed. If it's installed, it's gonna report that there's no change and just bail um, and say that it, it's uh, no changes happen, it's just gonna be okay. Uh, it also will use all the right commands and invocations to answer the prompt to install it. It, um, it preserves the output and Ansible's output. It doesn't dump it to the screen, so it's quiet by default, but you can make it more verbose easily. Uh, so it does all that stuff for us and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, so that's the first command. Uh, the second command is we're going to use another module from Ansible uh, called the copy module. Uh, I'll just copy this. Copy configuration file. So instead of using CP to copy a file, which this file would already need to be present on the server, uh, which means that we'd also need to like rsync it to the server or use SCP or something to copy it up if this shell script were being run from your local machine or a central CI system. Um, we're gonna use Ansible's copy module and we're actually gonna use another feature of Ansible uh, called loops or uh, there's a shortcut to it called with items that I use a lot. Um, so we're going to copy two files so we have two items in a loop that we're gonna run through. So uh, with the copy module, there's the, the, the basic way to use it is to give a source for the file and this is going to be uh, templated, so I'll get to that in a second. A destination, and I'll get to that in a second, because that's gonna be templated to an owner for the file. So in this case, we want the file to be owned by root uh, once it's copied, and a group, 
And this saves us from having to copy the file and then change permissions using chmod and change the ownership using uh, chone and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And we can pass it a file mode. Uh, 0644 is the right file mode for these two configuration files in Apache. Uh, obviously, these things will change depending on what kind of application you're managing and how its configuration files are managed, but uh, this is for Apache. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say with items, and this tells Ansible that there's multiple things that we're going to we're going to uh, process. The first one, uh, and we're going to use a YAML list, which is if you have just a little dash that starts the first item in a list or an array. Uh, and uh, the first item is going to have two properties, a source, httpd.config, and a dest, which is this right here. Uh, and then the second item is going to have a source of, uh, what is the second one? Uh, this with .config, I missed that. Uh, dest is this guy here. And then um, now to use these in the tasks, so I, I left these empty because I was going to show how to use these things. We're going to use Jinja, uh, which is a syntax for templating things in Python. Jinja is very similar to, uh, I forget what it's called in Go, Go template or something. It's, it's a syntax for replacing variables and it has filters and things. Right now we're just going to uh, put a variable in here. And uh, these two, the open and close brackets, uh, this indicates I'm going to use a Jinja variable. Uh, and I'm going to use Jinja. So I'm going to do that for both of these. And then when you use with items, Ansible creates a magic variable called item that has the data for each of these items. And then it's going to run the task once for each of these items. So it'll run it, run it once for this and then run it again for this. Uh, so we'll have item and then dot .src. Uh, this is an important thing to understand when you're using Ansible and Jinja, and this is one of the few cases where it is helpful to know how Jinja works and how Ansible works and how, how it uses Python on the back end. Um, typically, it's convenient to access properties of something in Python using dot notation. So item dot source is the item, that's this whole thing, and then it's the dot src, that's, that's the, the part of it that you want. There's another way that's a little more verbose to do this is you can do this syntax, which is, I don't know exactly what it's called. Um, it's similar in, in PHP if you want to access a property of something. Uh, well, and I should get out of PHP because I could confuse myself and everyone else here. Um, oh, I have the wrong destination here. Sorry about that. Thanks, Oliver. Uh, and now I still have the wrong destination, HTTPD. Um, these, this is the equivalent of doing item.src. However, sometimes it's safer to do it this way. If you are um, accessing an array item that has, uh, let's say, a dash in it. So like, let's say that that's the variable. If you do it this way, uh, then Python doesn't really like that. So that's not going to be a problem in any of the examples that we're going to get to in this especially the first few chapters of the book, but it's it's something to keep in mind. If you do, if you go off from this episode and you start building a bunch of playbooks and run into weird issues, sometimes it's due to that. Um, so I just wanted to get that, uh, clear that road mine for you now. And so for this one, it's simply item.dest. Uh, so that's going to say, pass these to the copy module, do it first with this item, do it second with that item. Uh, and then next up, we have the uh, the service state. We want to make sure it's started and it's enabled on boot up. Uh, so we're going to use Ansible service module for that. So I'm going to say name. Uh, yeah, make, well, we'll do this here. Uh, another thing that I do a lot of times when I'm writing tasks is instead of saying start Apache, because this is it technically it won't start Apache if it's already if it's already started. So to name the task appropriately, I say like ensure Apache is started. Or something like that. Or I say um, in the book, I have make sure Apache is started now and at boot, just to be a little more precise in what, what it's doing. And we're going to use Ansible's service module uh, for that. And we're going to say name equals, or name is HTTPD, and state is started, and enabled is yes. Uh, another note on YAML syntax is. Yes, and you can use yes or no for a Boolean, or you can say uh, true or false, 
And in some cases, but this is always a bad idea, you can use a one or a zero. Um, it's always a bad idea to do, to do that because you start running into weird typing issues. And uh, that's a problem with any dynamically uh, defined language. And um, I always stick to true and false just to be super clear. But uh, it's often, see, you can also see people using yes and no a lot. Um, and you'll notice that my editor, I'm using Sublime Text 3, my editor has a YAML uh, syntax formatter in it that, that identifies these things for me. So it's, it's easier for me to see things where I, you know, like for instance, the mode here, uh, this is an octal. And uh, so ident it identifies that with a different color, which makes it more helpful for me to know what's going on here. Uh, it also would do that for a simple integer, um, but, but it's helpful to have a code editor that highlights uh, YAML for you so that you can see what you're doing. And if you, if you accidentally have an extra typo in there, this is going to break because that's a string and not a Boolean anymore. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to say true there just to be super clear about it. And now if I delete all this, uh, this playbook will install Apache, copy some configuration files, and start the service and make sure it's enabled. There's a couple caveats to it. Um, we're not going to get into everything right now because this is the first playbook, the first real playbook we've ever written um, with item potence. But uh, uh, one thing is that, it, let, let's say it's the second time you're running this playbook and you have this configuration file and you change something in it, you'd want to restart the service. And this is going to make sure it's started, but, you know, and, and you could say restarted, and that would make sure it's always restarted, but you don't, every time you run the playbook, if you didn't want to make a change, you don't want this to restart the service because anyone connected to your server might have an error while it's restarting, something like that. Um, so it would be better to also say, like, if these files change, restart the service. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but for this playbook, I'm, I'm just defining some of the basics. We're also getting up on... Uh, on time, so I, you know, I, I don't think we'll get into other examples, but I did want to run the server against, or run this playbook against that server. Show you what happens. Uh, one unfortunate thing is I don't have a HTTP, HTTPD config file or vhost config file right now, so I'm just going to comment this, um, this particular section. Actually, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy them, and then we'll just let it, uh, we'll let this fail. Um, and then we'll, we'll, it's just to illustrate how to run the playbook. Um, so I'm going to create an HTTP, HT, I can't say it. I'm just going to create it, not going to say the word. Uh, touch HTTP.config. I said it, didn't I? Touch uh, vhost.config. Okay, so we have these two files. They're empty, so Apache is going to blow up and hate us, but that's okay for now. Uh, so I'm going to run this playbook. I'm going to say... Uh, Ansible playbook, and just like the Ansible command, you can pass it an inventory file, and then playbook.yaml, and I'm going to see if I had any typos here because I haven't, uh, I didn't uh, check the syntax of the playbook. It looks like it's working, so that's good. Uh, so it, uh, the first step is it always gathers facts. You can actually turn that off if you don't need that. If you know everything about your server and you don't need to change anything in your playbook, you can do that. Um, uh, but uh, for me, I, I like to leave it enabled if I do need to use it for flagging on any, any differences. Now, the first thing is I, I just noticed I need to be root to perform this command. Uh, so there's a few different ways you can approach that. Uh, one is you can call the playbook with dash b to become the root user for the entire playbook. Um, another way is if there's just one task that you need to do it. So like, let's say it was just this, I could say become uh, true or become yes or become one, but I'm going to say true just to be super explicit. Um, so if it was just this task, I can do that and it'll become the root user using sudo for that. Uh, in this case, though, this is going to re require me to be root and this is going to require to be, I can't speak at all today. Uh, all of these are going to require me to be root. So I'm going to, at the playbook level, uh, add become true. And that's going to make me the root user on the server using sudo uh, for all the different tasks in the playbook. So I'll go ahead and run that. And RR West mentions that these are called mustaches. Yes, I was uh, completely missing on that, blanking on that name. But in, in many templating languages, you use mustaches to template things. Uh, 
and it's extremely rare that you have to have mustaches inside the templated output. Uh, but when you need to do that, you can do something like uh, back or forwards. But it's, that's a backslash, you know, something like that. But we won't get there. Um, none of the examples in the book have that. Uh, so as I as I mentioned, since I copied the these files and we basically blew up Apache, and this won't work. Uh, but since I used Ansible's modules for everything, the second time I run this, it's going to check if these are installed, and it's going to see yes, they're already installed, and um, doesn't have to make any changes, so it just gives me OK. And for this, it checks those, those files and makes sure the content is the same. If it's the same, it reports OK. Um, and then for the service, obviously, it's still going to fail uh, because of the fact that, um, that the configuration files are empty. And I can actually use Ansible uh, to check on what that is doing. Inventory, uh, what is it? Um, EC2 is the server, uh, dash A, just run the command that this gives me, and it's going to give me the output for, for that service, and I can see, uh, let's see, what is it saying? In process exited. It's not giving me anything really helpful there, but I know that the problem is that I just gave it an empty configuration, and Apache does not like that kind of situation. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we've gotten through our first playbook. There's There's some other things you can do. So uh, in this, in, in the, uh, let me open this back up. If you had multiple servers, another thing that you can do when you're running Ansible Playbook, this works for Ansible too, but um, I didn't mention it till now. Uh, if you have multiple servers and you just wanted to, if you wanted to run a command on all but one server, let's say, uh, you could say Ansible Playbook, and this is the other directory, so don't, don't sue me about that. Uh, but you could say Ansible Playbook dash I inventory multi, multi, T. Um, man, my spelling has taken a dive as we get into the uh, end of the hour, but um, I can give it uh, a limit, and the limit can can um, do a few different things. One is you can say limit uh, db, and that's just going to run it on the database server. Obviously, you could also just target the database server, uh, but you can also limit it to one server in particular, so like 192.168.60.6, so that would just run it on that one server. Or I could say limit equals 192.168.60.5 for just one of the two app servers. You can also use things like uh, negations, which I believe is like uh, exclamation point colon or something like that. You'd have to look up the documentation for that. Uh, but you could do not db, something, something along those lines. Um, so you can limit where playbooks run. Uh, you can also, another thing that I didn't mention before is there's, I believe it's the Ansible inventory command, uh, Ansible inventory, and you can say dash dash list. And what this does, oh, and I, I didn't give it, um, let me clear that out. I didn't give it uh, the inventory file, so dash i inventory. If you ever need to see if a server is available or if you're using the right inventory or something like that, you can use this command, the Ansible inventory, to get a list of everything it knows about all your servers through the inventory. Uh, this is also helpful if you're debugging uh, inventory script or an external inventory system integration with Ansible. Uh, but I think that's that's all I'll get to now. Um, chapter four has plenty more. Um, I'm I've been kind of going through the different examples to see what's what's better to um, uh, to run through on the live stream because I, I probably won't be able to get to all of the examples in detail uh, that are in the book on this live stream just for time limitations. I don't want this. I don't, I don't want to, to spend six months on chapter four, uh, but we'll probably get into another playbook that's a little more of a real world scenario uh, with an application that runs on your server and you do a deployment through Git, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll probably get to that in the next episode and I'll, I'll go through a few more of the options you can pass to the Ansible, Ansible playbook command uh, for debugging and, and for more information about it. Um, but uh, anything else in chat that I need to run through? Um, let's see, do, do, do. where's my mouse? There it is, it's on the other screen. Uh, some people talking about AWX. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about AWX uh, later on as well. That's gonna be in, I, th I think it's like chapter, chapter 10 or chapter nine or something like that. Again, if, if you don't have my book, this, this live stream is basically following along with different examples in my book. 
So if you don't have the book, please go and grab it. Uh, go to ansiblefordevops.com. And uh, most of the questions that you're asking, a lot of them have answers in the book somewhere. Uh, and we'll get to them in the live streams. But um, again, thank you for being on. If you want to put really quick, I forgot to ask this earlier. I always like to know uh, where you're from in the, in the live chat. It's cool to see where all the different people that are watching this are from, just to see kind of the global community. Um, and also, I really hope that you're doing well. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of sad when I hear some people having some issues with their jobs and job security right now. Um, know that I'm I'm still uh, praying for you, whether or not you're you're religious or not. Um, I will say some prayers to help help uh, get everybody through this time. And um, please consider if if you are benefiting from this and you have the means, uh, please consider either paying for the book or uh, supporting me on GitHub or Patreon. The links are below. Also, if you like this, hit the like button, hit subscribe, all the YouTube things, hit the notification bell. I don't care too much about it, but apparently it helps with algorithms and things, so I guess it's helpful to me. Um, uh, but thank you very much, and I will see you next week, same time, same place, uh, 10 a.m. U.S. Central, 3 p.m. UTC, uh, so day, evening, uh, morning, w wherever you are in the world depending on where you are. Uh, but it's it's great to see so many people. It looks like we have California in the USA, Bulgaria, UK, Orlando, Florida in the USA, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, Canada, India. Uh, one person from India, but in Toronto. So awesome to see that. Um, Canada, it's funny, it's one country I have never been into, but I've had like five chances and they've all come very close and then I just never got up there. I was in Seattle last year and had a chance to run up to, to Canada. But... Uh, Obviously not going to happen in the next few months, but uh, I will hopefully get up there. Every Canadian that I've met is very kind and, and generous. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and end the stream, and I never know when it actually ends, so it'll probably cut me off mid-sentence. Uh, we'll see. Or my computer will lock up, and I won't be able to end the stream. And you'll just hear me rambling, because I clicked on the end stream button, and nothing's happening yet.